it's a rich man's world. Some of you are wondering, what kind of a worship chorus is that? Uh, that's a song by a 70s super group, disco group, ABBA. And uh, it could have been Dancing Queen. Hey, it could have been different, right? Um, I love that song as an introduction to uh, our series on lesser gods. And this morning's topic is money. And I love that because uh, it so permeates our culture. And that song could have been any number of songs. I mean, AC, DC, Money Talks. It could have been Donna Summers. She worked hard for the money. It could have been Nelly, right? Hey, it must be the money. It could have been... P. Diddy, right? Uh, Mo money, mo problems. I mean, I can, by the way, I can keep going. I got a long, long list. Dire straits, right? Money for nothing. We can keep going. And it's everywhere in society. There's uh, TV shows about money, right? Uh, the Apprentice. Uh, speaking of the OJs, money, 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 right? Now you think about that and you think, here comes The Apprentice. That whole show is about making money. Every reality show, every game show, what's the prize at the end of the rainbow? It's a pot of money. It permeates our movies. One of the most famous lines of all time comes from Jerry Maguire. And that line is, show me the... Yeah, you all know it, right? I mean, money is just absolutely everywhere. In fact, it's kind of permeated our uh, American uh, mythology. But when we talk about what it means to be American, a lot of people talk about rags to riches kind of stories. He was nothing, but in America, he got really, really wealthy. And that sounds great until you realize that the American dream is actually about opportunity. It's about pursuing your dream even if you don't know whether you're going to be rich one day or not. The idea isn't the gold. The idea of the American dream is really something else. But it shows you kind of how far we've really drifted. I think ever since the Carter election, uh, American presidential elections have been about electing not a commander-in-chief but an economist-in-chief. As most of the conversations that dominate the debates or that dominate kind of the American conversation really have to do with wealth. And so we see that money is everywhere, right? And it's absolutely all around us, all the time, everywhere. And we see that money is really a problem in society. And yet here's what's interesting about this particular topic. No one ever admits that money is their God. And so what happens is we see it all around us and we say, well, I think God is absolutely money in American culture. I think that person might be chasing money more than they're chasing anything else. But if you were to ask anybody, so is money your main God? They would say, oh, no, 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 not me. So it seems like it's everywhere and it's nowhere. And we get genuinely confused about the subject. I, I want to just read to you four quotes by John Rockefeller. John Rockefeller was a very famous uh, billionaire, really, kind of factoring currency exchanges and all of that. Very, very famous uh, businessman. And these are quotes that kind of happen in sequential order in his life. Now, this is what he says as a young man. He says, I know of nothing more despicable and pathetic than a man who devotes all the hours of the waking day to the making of money for money's sake. Sounds pretty good to me. It sounds pretty good to you. We would all listen to that and go, absolutely, man. He's on to something there. A little bit later on in his life, when he's making money, what's he say? He says, do you know the only thing that gives me pleasure is to see my dividends coming in. Later on, he says, it is wrong to assume that men of immense wealth are always happy. Now he's got all that money, he sees behind the veil. And then towards the end of his life, he's asked by this young reporter, hey, Mr. Rockefeller, you have everything. I mean, come on, how much money is enough? And J.D. Rockefeller raises one gnarled finger and says, just one dollar more. What happens when money becomes your God? I think D.H. Lawrence put it best. And we'll put the quote up on the screen. He said, money is our madness, our vast collective madness. Money is everywhere and it's nowhere and it's confusing and it's clear and we're not sure, but we are absolutely obsessed with it. And so this morning, we're committed to meeting that madness head on, as we do with many difficult topics at Grace Point. And let's make no mistake, this is a tough topic. 
But we're going to meet it head on and we're going to meet it with the Bible. Now, here's the challenge. The Bible actually has a lot to say about money. Jesus talks a lot about money. 16 of the 38 parables were concerned with how to handle money and possessions. In the gospel, an amazing one out of 10 verses, 288 in all, deal directly with money or possessions. In fact, the Bible mentions money over 2,000 times. It's going to be a long morning. So just strap in 2,000 verses to get through. No, we're not going to do that. In fact, I think we found one passage I think is going to help us all in this uh, uh, topic as we kind of figure out, Lord, is this my priority? If, if it isn't or if it is, how do I adjust? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, and we're going to begin with verse 7. Proverbs chapter 30, and we're going to begin with verse 7. And we're going to read to verse 9. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 to 9 as we look at the words of the Lord. Not a lot of people go to Proverbs very often, but it's a great book of the Bible to check out. It comes right after Psalms. Some of you are still looking for it. In my Bible, it's page number 614, if that helps at all. Some of you are a little faster. You've got a digital device, and you're like, what are you waiting for, Derek? I'm already here. Why don't you stand with me in honor of God's, God's word? Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, well, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning just admitting that we are absolutely swimming in a sea of conversation about money. Whether it's magazines like Forbes or Inc or Entrepreneur or anything like that, all the way to conversations in the kitchen table as people are trying to figure out how to pay bills. This topic seems to absolutely dominate our lives. And Father God, what we need this morning isn't a better opinion on money. What we need this morning is your wisdom on money. And so what we're asking you for is clarity. Help us to sift through all the noise, because there's a lot of it, and find your clear, small, still voice, and follow it wholeheartedly. In your son's name, amen. You may be seated. Proverbs is a compilation of wisdom sayings. It's God's word. It's God's inspired word. And it's a compilation. It's one of three books that King Solomon uh, uh, wrote. Um, In this case, he compiles this book, but he's the one who initiates it. King Solomon is known as the wisest king in the Bible. He's a man of immense wealth. Um, He's written uh, one of the most embarrassing books in the Bible. In fact, it's a book that I uh, rarely go to or preach from because I tend to turn into a junior high school boy um, and I I start to blow and I get a little giggly and that's the book of the Song of Solomon and so he's written that and he's written a book called Ecclesiastes which is a really more of a postmodern kind of book and it's a beautiful book and in that book Solomon who has all this money comes to the conclusion that money doesn't actually get you very much it's an astonishing conclusion In the book of Proverbs, Solomon's been compiling these wisdom sayings, knowing that there's something really divine about them. And these are the sayings of Agur. Agur is one of the wise men of Judah. And so Agur has a lot of great things to say. And in this particular passage, I think he has some of his most profound thoughts. Now, when we first read this passage, here's what we think we read. Okay, you're telling me not to lie and to be middle class. Right? Right? You read it and you go, keep lying, falsehood far from me. Don't let me be too rich. Don't let me be too poor. Okay, can I go home now? It's like that, that was the whole thing. And actually that's a misreading of the text. Because that's a little bit like talking about cows and milkshakes. You can kind of see some sort of connection, but you're not, they're like too far apart. In fact, what he's saying is, look, with wealth, whether the absence of wealth or the abundance of wealth, there are a lot of, of lies and falsehoods out there. So... Keep me from being distracted by all the lies that money will throw at me. Either the lack of it or the abundance of it. Keep me from the falsehoods of those things. And then he says, let's look at the rich and let's look at the poor. That's really how he starts. And so for us to begin this morning and to begin with the text and with him, we have to look at falsehoods. We have to look at things as they really are. Now to have that discussion, we have to talk about sin. 
And it's very difficult to talk about sin because when you do, most people things think of things that they did, right? What are bad things people do? Murder is a sin. Stealing is a sin. And you think about those deeds. But Augustine, who was this uh, church father back uh, many years ago, he wrote a book called Confessions. And in that book, he was trying to distill down what sin is. And he said this, and I'll put it on the screen. He said, listen, listen the essence of sin is disordered love. The essence of sin is disordered love. Yes, it's actions, bad things you do, but it's also sometimes putting good things in the wrong priority. It's a disordering of the things that you love. Let me give an illustration. Pursuing a career is a great thing. God talks a lot about work in his word, and he talks about the value of work, and he talks about not being lazy. So a career is a good thing, but if you place your career over the priority of your family, it's a disordered love, and that can wreak all kinds of havoc in your life. There are both good things. Family is good, career is good, but when you get them out of order and out of whack, bad things tend to happen. And a lot of people tend to think of priorities like this kind of stackable uh, uh, Lego bricks or the stackable cement bricks, and they're in there and they'll never change. But priorities aren't really like that. Priorities tend to slip at a moment's notice. You're, you're always wrestling through your priorities and you have to be aware of your priorities or you're not able to make great decisions on your own. Here's why. Whenever you make decisions based on your own sense of priority, you are building with a flawed frame because you make mistakes. You screw up. I screw up. That's true of humanity in general. So how do we build on a solid frame so the house doesn't fall down? And the answer to that is to build on God's sense of priorities. And that means God's sense of ordered love, not disordered love. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had uh, John Spritzer come to our house. Um, and he uh, put, he's an amazing electrician. He put some plugs into our house, into our garage. And we left for the morning, and when we came back, he said, oh, hey, listen, there was a wire kind of over by your garage door, and you should know I fixed that. Your garage door works now. And we were like, now, there's some backstory here. For the last two years, my wife and I have been living avoiding the garage door as much as we humanly possibly could. <laughs> Because it just, it only worked from the inside when you push the button and you had to hold it down for it to go up and down. Now we had it on a list. Uh, we were going to spend a few hundred dollars and get a new garage door opener. We figured the whole thing was busted, right? And, and so we were like, okay, we're going to get this one day, but it's low on the totem pole of things to kind of worry about. And so for two years, we would pull up and try to avoid the garage door. I would only get to the garage door if I had to mow the lawn, right? And it's like, I'll go out there, push the thing, wait, you know, read a book, read another chapter, the thing opens, take the lawn, right, and then get back in, and you, you kind of go through it. And so we just, we spent time doing that. When we came back, he, for him to say, I fixed the wire, we're like, the whole thing's not busted? Like, it totally shifted our norms. Now, he was making things healthy. He was making things right that were broken. We had already altered our lifestyle based on brokenness. That's what most people do. They live in a house that's broken, they learn to live with it and they just forget what health looks like, what good priorities look like. I'm telling you, he fixed that garage door and Melissa and I were like little kids. Push it again. <laughs> so it's great. You know. We actually left in the car to go back somewhere so we could drive around the block to come back and like push the thing. So look at that, it went up again. I know, it went down. So we were super excited about that. And so we have to be aware of these priorities in our lives, right? We have to kind of get back to a house that is fixed. Well, how do you recognize some of those priorities? Well, Tim Keller was talking at Cambridge University, and, and he was trying to help them figure out how to assess priorities. And so here was his question. He said, what thing, if you lost it, could tell me that you would nearly lose the will to live, that almost all significance and value would be drained out of your life? What one thing, if you lost it, would cause you to nearly lose the will to live, that have all significance and value drained out of your life. That would be an idol. An idol can be a good thing, but it's a thing that you look to to give to you what only the Creator can give you. It's something that dominates your life. Jeremiah chapter 2 says this. I promise. Jeremiah chapter 2 says this. It's 11 through 13. Has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods? 
But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and um, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, a distorted priority can hold water for a time, right? It's like, okay, I'm, really work is first or money is first or comfort is first or whatever it is, but that thing comes first and that can hold water for the time. But here's the problem. It's a lie. It's broken. And so it's going to leak and it will never satiate your life. It will never satisfy your soul. So let's just answer the question. Is money bad? Here's the answer. No. Money's not bad, but the disordered priority of money is sin. The distorted priority of money is sin. And the irony of that is, again, no one seems to think that this is a God in their life. So here's my question. And this is the question that I want you to really think about as you think about, has this become a God in my life? Again, priorities aren't cement bricks, right? They're more things that slip easy, like a slip disc, like an off back, something that needs adjustment. So here's the question. What dominates your worries, conversations, or aspirations? What thing dominates your worries, conversations, or aspirations? And here's the secondary question, is it money? Does money dominate your worries, conversations, or aspirations? Well, Agur is going to begin with wealth. And he's going to say, help me not to have too much. And he says, what? Lest I become full. And so he begins by kind of saying, Lord, yeah, I, I want to be away from these lies. And so let me look at the lie, the falsehood really of wealth. And I think there are three predominant falsehoods when it comes to the lies of wealth. Here's the first one. The lie of validation. The lie of validation. Money validates who I am. And society kind of backs this up, right? If you do a good job at work, how do they validate your good job? What do you get? You get a raise or you get a bonus. I'm going to validate that with cash. And a lot of people will validate their very identity with money. Now, this is something that I see even in my own extended family. I was uh, at a family event uh, uh, earlier this summer and hadn't seen some relatives in a while. And, hey, man, how you doing? And um, several times it was, how am I doing? I make X amount per year. I'm doing great. A lot of people will use wealth as a way to kind of validate. I didn't graduate high school, but I got a boat. I didn't graduate college, but look, I'm okay, right? It's the money validation. I will hear parents brag on their kids. And you know what their brag is? He makes six figures this year. She, she just got a promotion at work and she, she makes a lot of money. She's okay. It's a validation of identity. Now, here's the problem. When you validate your identity with wealth, the lack of wealth becomes a lack of identity. And this is why stockbrokers will hurl themselves out of skyscrapers on a Black Monday because no wealth, no value. No wealth, no value. This is why men and women go around insecure, always striving for the next dollar so they can prove to their mom or their dad or their relative or whoever it is that in fact they're worth it. Their identity is okay. And it's a lie. It's the lie of validation. Second lie, I think, that comes with wealth is the lie of security. Have you ever had that conversation? You know, when we just get enough, we'll be more secure. Like, wouldn't it be great to not have to worry about it? We're going to be so secure. Like, honey, like when that, you know, IRA hits that amount, we're going to be so secure. Our retirement, that's really going to make us secure. And that's a lie. Why? Because it doesn't matter how much you have, a tornado can still blow through your house. It's a lie. You could still be walking down the street and get murdered. You could be surrounded by bodyguards, put yourself in a remote place, rely on daddy's oil money, and the U.S. Army will still find bin Laden. Your wealth isn't going to protect you from life. And yet when we talk about money, we talk about security all the time, right? Oh, maybe it'll... No, no, really, we'll be okay then. Here's the problem. You keep chasing that lie. Every time you think you're secure, you're always going to want $1 more to make you even more secure than you already are. And when something bad happens to you, you're going to wonder who to blame. Number three, the lie of comparison. The lie of comparison. 
This is really kind of the lie of keeping score. At least I have more than that guy. At least I don't live on that side of the tracks, right? It's almost a snobbery lie, but nobody wants to say, we're snobs. Nobody wants to say that, right? It's just that, well, you know, at least I'm not that guy. At least I'm not that girl. And so people will buy mansions that are empty. They can't afford the mansion. Why? Well, I can't lose face in the, in the light of this comparison. After all, everybody around me seems to have a really nice house. I got to like buy high so that everybody will think I'm doing well. Lest anybody think, oh my goodness, he may or she may actually have more modest means. I mean, my goodness, an apartment. I don't know if I can handle that. And so they buy into this lie of comparison. And you know, at a certain kind of wealth point, the really wealthy people, they're not asking how many dollars anymore. They're comparing anyway. Like it doesn't matter how many dollars you have, you're, you're still in competition with other people. You're still comparing yourself. D. Uh, H. L. Hunt put it this way. He said, money is just a way of keeping score. It's just a way of keeping score. Agor recognizes this. He says, okay, Help me to not be so full. Why does, why does he say that? He says, well, lest I be full and deny you. Lest I be full and deny you. Now, again, money itself is just a thing, okay? It's this love of money. And the challenge with having a lot of money, is, and the reason why Jesus say it's easier for the poor to get into heaven than a rich man, you know, uh, to get into heaven because he has to go like a camel through the eye of a needle and he has that whole kind of story. The reason he says that all of that is so tough is because the temptation, if you have wealth, is to stop living by faith and start living by resources. The temptation is to stop living by faith and to start living by resources. When Jesus sends out the 72, he's very deliberate. He sends them out with no money bags. Why? Does Jesus just hate money? Well, no, because Jesus actually has a treasurer. I mean, Jesus didn't have to have a treasurer, right? He could have said, abject poverty is the greatest spiritual high you'll ever experience. But he doesn't do that. He has a treasurer. He understands money. He says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Jesus understands all that, but he's trying to teach his disciples what it means to have a priority, to say, no, your first reliance is not going to be to ask how much you have. Your first step is to ask, what do I want you to do? You are to live by faith. That's why scripture says the just or the righteous shall live by faith, by faith. Now, if you have resources, the temptation is to say, I live by resources. I can and therefore I will. Or, you know, God, like, I need you because I keep reading books that tell me about that and I worship you and I really desire you. But honestly, I'll be okay this year. And so we just cease making leaps of faith. We cease saying, well, what if I didn't have anything? Now, I want you to listen to me. God does not want you to be rich. God's desire for your life is not that you are monetarily wealthy. God's desire for your life is that you are fulfilled and growing in him. It's a very different thing. And anytime you go to a church or you hear some preacher or you hear somebody say, Jesus wants you to be rich. He wants you to have a beautiful wife and a beautiful family and a beautiful house. And really, he just wants you to be just so wealthy. That's a lie from the pit. It's a lie. Now, he does want you to manage your steward, your, your, steward your resources well. He does want you to save. He does want you to pay attention. And by the way, this is why in economically poor countries, when their revival breaks out there and people turn to Jesus, the economic standard of that country rises. But wealth is not going to validate your identity. Wealth is not going to give you more security. Wealth for sure is not going to uh, help you uh, in, in being the person God wants you to be. Wealth is something you have to put a check on and say, am I relying more on that than I am on the Lord? Uh, I meet with a lot of people who uh, uh, like to talk about uh, money or resources. And one of the things that uh, a lot of them like to say, uh, say to me is, you know, Derek, I've got all this money and, and uh, I really think God's gift in my life, like my calling is just to be super generous. Like, have you ever had anybody say, 
what disciple would you like to be like? And you think to yourself, well, I'd like to be like Peter because he walked on water for a time. Oh yeah, that's right, he sunk and then he denied Jesus. Okay, I don't want to be like Peter. And then you think, like, oh, I want to be like Paul. Like, because Paul was so smart and everybody just admired him. Oh, that's right. He died horribly. And, um, you know, he, he keeps talking about some of the trials and tribulations. And then in the back of our minds, we can't say it out loud because it's just back there. We think, ooh, Joseph of Arimathea. Like, I could be Joseph of Arimathea. I could be the guy who gives Jesus the tomb, right? I want to be that wealthy. So Derek, here's my gift to the kingdom. I'm going to be really, really rich so that I can just bless others with riches. Do you think Jesus wants your first pursuit to be riches so you can bless others with riches? No, he may provide you with that so you can be a blessing, but his primary concern isn't that you somehow become rich. So the reason living with wealth is hard is the temptation to cease living by faith, but instead by resources. Here's what 1 Timothy has to say about uh, the idea of wealth. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich, desire to be rich, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, the love of money, is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So many people fall to the allure of money. Well, they say the love of money. Mark Twain put this on its ear and he said, well, you say the love of money is the root of all evil. I say the lack of money is the root of all evil. And so a lot of people will look at the poor in society and they'll say, see, the reason that we have so much evil in society is because people are poor. There's so much poverty in society. And of course, we need to address that head on too, right? Because the truth is you can be poor and happy and people tend to forget that. They assume that if you're poor, you have to be miserable. And the problem is that you start to focus on everybody else and you start to believe that if only I had this or had that, that my key to everything lies over there. Now, there's a few people who believe that poverty equals holiness. And so there might be three or four in this room. That's your aspiration, right? You're thinking, oh, Derek, I want to be like biblical. And so I've decided that to be the poorer you are, the more holy you must be and more spiritual. So, you know, you move to a third world country and they're like, hey, welcome. <laughs> what are you doing here? Oh, I'm just, I want to be holy, as holy as you are. Now, the problem with that is it's just money. That becomes a whole different God. You're skewing poverty with holiness. The reason some people become poor is in order to reach other people. You know, God can call people into poverty in order to reach others, but he does that purely as a bridge to someone else. He does that to say, look, I want you to come over here, so be like them. And because money then isn't a priority, what do we say? Okay, Lord, if that's what you want, <clears throat> that's what I'm willing to do. So there may be some in this room that you think, oh, poor is the aspiration, right? Hey, I don't have much, and that makes me super spiritual because I'm super reliant on God. Actually, it doesn't mean that at all. But I think for the majority of us, when we look at poverty, we think in terms of when we are poor, what does that do to us? What does the craving for money do to a poor person? Because a lot of us in this room, here's what we think. Well, I'm not particularly fabulously wealthy, right? I, I get it. Maybe there's something wrong. What dominates my worries, my conversations, and my aspirations? Maybe I do have a money issue, but, you know, I'm not super wealthy. So Agur has something to say to us as well. He says, well, what about the poor? Keep me from poverty lest I steal. And so he addresses poverty uh, in the context of this. And we have to remember that this permeates every part of who we are. Uh, Melissa and I, when we were uh, young, we were poor. And uh, we never thought of ourselves as being massively poor until, you know, we got to the end of the month and realized we broke even and praise God. You know, we didn't have a dollar to save, but we were okay with that, kind of. And... Uh, and we would, uh, we would go take walks. And that was our treat to ourselves, was we would go for a walk and get a McDonald's uh, soft serve cone, which was a dollar. And we would walk along, and as a part of that walk, especially in the early years, we would play a game. And I was usually the one to start it, because that's how I roll. And so we would walk along, and I'd say, hey, honey, what if tomorrow we got a million dollars? You've probably never had this conversation, but we've had this conversation. Kind of <laughs> so what if we got a million dollars? And we'd walk along and she'd go, well, 
First thing we do is tithe. Oh yeah, we tithe. Absolutely, that's exactly what we do, tithe. You know, then what do you want to do? Well, then we pay off bills. Oh yeah, we pay off the bills. You know, that's really important too. Then what we do, you know, it's like, I don't know. I don't know what would happen. Then we get a boat. Yeah, we just get a boat, you know. And we'd have all these conversations about this stuff. And then after the end of that conversation, we would have to repent. We'd have to kind of go, wait a second. Our happiness isn't based on that. It's not based on the stuff. Our kids, as they were uh, uh, young, they were raised in a, an environment where we didn't have a lot of money. And I don't know fully how this kind of played into their life, but I can tell you what some of our conversations looked like when they were young. Um, we would ask the parental question because we love our children. We'd say, so tell me what you want to be when you get older. Has anybody here ever asked that question? Every kids, what do you want to be when you get old, right? And so we would ask our kids at various points of their life, and at various points of their life, you get different answers. I want to be a hamster. I want to be a, you know, a Star Wars fighter. I want to be an insurance salesman, right? So it's got, it kind of covers that whole kind of gamut. And uh, early on, uh, we asked Josiah, so, you know, tell me what you want to be. And Josiah said, I want to be a garbage man. And we said, oh, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, it's like, a, okay, all right, you know, okay, Lord, you know, all right, I got you. Why a garbage man? And in our church that we were pastoring at the time, one of our deacons was the CFO of waste management. And we had been to his house, and Josiah, just as a little boy, looked around, and he thought, Garbage is where the money's at. <laughs> we would ask Benjamin the same thing. Benjamin, what would you like to be? And Benjamin would, would say, I, I want to be an inventor. And I'm going to have an invention, and it's going to be so ridiculously successful that I'm going to build a castle. And you're going to have an entire wing in that castle. Well, what if we don't want to live with you, son? Then I'm going to build you a castle right next door to my castle. Don't worry, I'm going to take care of everything. We'll be in the same street. So we're still holding him to that promise, by the way. But... <laughs> Something in him said, uh, you know, I want to have a lot of money. That's the aspiration. And that's really what a lot of poor folk do. But Agur recognizes that all of that is a lie. And I think there are three lies here as well. The first lie is the lie of deferred happiness. The lie of deferred happiness. If only I can get that thing, well, then we'll be happy. If we could just make or save an extra $10,000 a year, then we would be happy. I meet so many people who get everything they want and they wind up being miserable. Because you know what happens once you get everything you want? You discover you still want more and you're still unhappy. So many young people get married and they get married with a full living room set. And it's impressive to Melissa and I because you know, our living room set was like a futon and a footlocker for a coffee table for years. And we go, man, you remember like futons? Yeah, absolutely. We sleep on them, man. We used them for a couch. It's like what we could afford. And there's nothing wrong with having a living room set. But the problem is, is that those same people who have all that stuff come around and they go, man, we would be so happy if only we could get out of this apartment and into a home. Oh, we would be so happy if only we could get out of this home and into a bigger home because it's way too small for us. I'd be so happy if I could finally get that jacuzzi I've been desperate for. No, no, you don't understand. I have a bad back. It's like important. And so they defer their happiness, always believing that the next thing is going to make them happier than they are now. And the truth is, it doesn't. You'll always be chasing that thing. Now, the thing may switch. You have a billion dollars. There's a lot of miserable, wealthy people out there who can tell you that having everything isn't all it's cracked up to be. There's the lie of bitterness and resentment. The lie of bitterness and resentment. And you see this with a lot of people that, you know what they do? They look around at everybody who has something and they think, how dare you? I have nothing. How? Look at them. I should have that. Now, I don't want to get into kind of wealth distribution and all the rest of that, but a lot of people get really bothered that everybody's not equally wealthy. And I do think you have to pay attention to income disparity. I think if the king has all the gold and all the peasants have nothing, we should pay attention to that. But honestly, why would you resent other people for having something if you have to focus on your own situation? If God is calling you to be content and satisfied and working what he has in front of you, instead of looking around going, like, I would love to be satisfied with this, but I don't think you understand, she has that. And I deserve that. What do you deserve? 
You deserve nothing. I deserve nothing. This idea that the dollar will somehow take away that bitterness isn't true. You'll be bitter for so long that when you finally have money, you'll just be a bitter, wealthy person. You'll find other ways to resent people, your life, or your situation. There's the lie of distraction. The lie of distraction. And this is where you always have another quick, rich scheme to make the dollar instead of just being faithful where you're at. Have you ever met people like that? Right? They've called you with their newest thing. And they're just distracted all the time. Benjamin Franklin, I think, put it this way. He said, he that is of the opinion money will do everything may well be suspected of doing everything for money. And this is why Agur says, you know, lest I steal. I'll do everything to get that. I got to get the dollar. It's Ocean's Eleven. It was the perfect crime. And he had it coming. But money's going to make me happy. No. Andy Stanley put it this way, and we'll put this over, up on the overhead screen. It says, greed is not a financial issue. It's a heart issue. Greed is not a financial issue. It's a heart issue. I was watching a documentary on Netflix the other day on a man named Steve Aoki. Steve Aoki is a world-renowned DJ for something called EDM music. EDM music, this is by the way all stuff I learned. EDM music means electronic dance music and he's really, really good at it. The documentary is about his life and his career and it's interesting because the centerpiece really of the documentary is his father. His father's name is Hiroki Aoki, which I think is great. <laughs> Hiroki Aoki was an Olympian wrestler who then went on to start a business. Came to the States penniless and he started Benihana restaurants. Became very, very wealthy. He became then a daredevil. You know the daredevils that you read about, on, you know, or you see on screen, they're in a, a new um, uh, air balloon to like travel the world and they're like, were daring each other. He was a part of them. He loved speed racing, his boat racing. And it was interesting that they were interviewing him and this entire documentary on his son Steve is on Steve trying to kind of win his father's approval, which he never could seem to do. And I mean beginning to end. Here's a guy who's accomplished so much and he's going, I, I, just, I just wish dad would have noticed. Well, as a part of this documentary, there was film footage and a reporter was interviewing Hiroki and here's what Hiroki said. He was asked, what are your priorities? He said, here, here are my priorities. Number one is business. Number two is health, so I can be good at business. And number three is family. Is it any wonder that those surrounded by children when he died, he didn't really know any one of them? And all of them, according to the documentary, weren't sure how to take him and were desperate for him to notice. Greed is not a financial issue. Greed is a heart issue. Well, Agur ends by saying, lest I profane the name of God. Now, when anytime you talk about the name of God or the glory of God, you're talking about the attributes of God. Lest I misrepresent who God is, right? How other, God, other people see God in my life. Uh, Jim Carrey uh, said this, and, I, and I, was, I happened to see it live when it happened. And so he said this, I said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Now that was an interview that happens later on in his career. Early in his career, he is the poster child for the Oprah Winfrey show. She has him on, you've dreamt it, and it came true. He would carry a $10 million check in his wallet. He was homeless for a while, and he would say, I'm gonna have that $10 million one day. And then sure enough, when he cut Ace Ventura, Peck Detective 2, the sequel, um, he got a $10 million payday. And then his career really took off from there. So suddenly he had all the money he ever wanted and he began to do all of the things he ever wanted to do. And here's what he recognized at the end of being able to do anything he wanted and having the means that he wanted to do it. It doesn't mean anything. It's worthless. Well, what's worthwhile? Well, worthwhile is representing God's attributes well. The pastor of the church that I went to high school in, his name was Gene Kern. Gene was the founding pastor uh, of the church that I went to, and it was an amazing church. I was really blessed by Gene. And when I was in seminary, Gene became my mentor for a full year. Gene, as a part of his retirement gift, 
uh, was gifted with the capacity to go to Sun City, which is a retirement community. Now, there's a Sun City in Arizona, but there was also a Sun City in California. And at the time, things were booming in the States. And Sun City was a very exclusive type of retirement communities. Only golf carts. You could only drive golf carts in this retirement community, right? Unless you were parked in your car. Grandchildren got the right to visit between 1 and 6 on Thursdays. Right? It's an adult playground and we love you, but not like we love you. <laughs> we'll come visit you, right? Like golf courses were pristine, pool holes, pinochle groups, everything you would want. Gene would go golfing. It was kind of what he liked to do. And about the third tee, because anytime you go golfing, you get put in a group. About the third tee, so tell me what you did. Uh, I was a pastor. He said it would take between the third tee and the 14th tee before anybody would talk to him again because of that answer. When they got to about the 14th tee, they started to ask these really insightful spiritual questions just to have conversation with him. When Gene became my mentor, the church that he started, because out of that, those conversations, God told him to start a church in that retirement community. Gene's church was running about 500 people with 80% of the people having been baptized in that church. And I was stunned. I, like, what's the secret sauce of ministry? You know, tell me, how did you do that? It's supposed to be the toughest group. They have all their priorities established. They, you know, they, they got everything they want. I mean, what, what in the world? How, how do you do that? They're older. Like, you know, I, I, I've already been there. I've heard that story. And here's what Gene told me. He said, no, it turned out to be very ripe for God to do something extraordinary because they had everything and they discovered they had nothing. They had everything and they discovered that they had nothing. So how do I honor God's name? If money is dominating my worries, my conversations, and my aspirations, how do I realign? How do I realign quickly? Five quick things. Number one, starve it. Number one, starve it. Uh, this last week we were in conversation, I was in conversation with Henry Dutton, and Henry was telling me about a recent trip he had taken down to go visit his family. Henry's family lives, I think, in either, it's either extreme east Tennessee or Kentucky, some place where the family tree never forks. It's one of those kind of that, I'm playing, it was a joke, okay. So I'm sure the family tree forks sometimes. Anyway, so, so he goes down there, and he's talking with his cousin, and his cousin's rather, uh, rather large. And she's a believer. And she had just gotten gastric bypass surgery. And here were her words to Henry. She said this. She says, I didn't even realize that food was an idol until I started eating soup. Because as a part of her recovery, she had to eat soup twice a day. The truth is, a lot of times we don't know what an idol is in our life until we try to starve it out. You know, that's why the Bible talks about fasting. The reason you fast from food isn't to get skinny. The reason you fast from food is to remind yourself how much control food can have over your life and to ask yourself the question, does my soul long for God as much as I want the next meal? Some people have to starve themselves from the TV set because it's the first thing they turn on in the morning and the last thing they turn off at night. Some people have to starve themselves from comfort. Some people have to starve themselves from their favorite grocery store. I, in the case of money, when was the last time you said, I wonder if we can live at this income level for this amount of time? Can we make it through a week without eating out? How does that work? When was the last time you tried to starve it to figure out whether you need to put it back into alignment? Number two, bring it into the light. Bring it into the light. This is what Romans 7 says. Romans 7 and verse 18 for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Okay, those of you who are Bible scholars, here's a simple question. Who said those words? Paul. Paul says those words. Wait a second, Derek. The Paul who writes a lot of the New Testament, same Paul. The Paul who's like really brainy and talks about how he loves God, same Paul. The Paul who's like my benchmark for holiness, like I aspire to be Paul, like Lord, I'll figure out how to be like Jesus later. First, let me be like Paul. Yeah, that, that Paul. Paul himself says, look, I do things that I hate doing. He begins with this idea of bringing his sin into the light and saying, Lord, I'm not nearly as great as I think I am. And you know the truth is, most of us tend to think, 
We ain't half bad. When was the last time you took a hard look at your life and your own sin grieved you? Really grieved you? Or was it more like I looked at my life and, at my life and honestly, I'm kind of on the right track. I can't say I'm perfect. <laughs> that would be arrogant. <laughs> I don't want to say that. You know. I mean, I make mistakes. You know, I think this morning I was pretty close to saying a curse word. Maybe, you know, I kind of got a little short, but that's about the extent of it, Derek. You know, honestly, I'm not half bad. The Apostle Paul, who has every reason to go, you know what? I'm starting churches. I'm out here. I'm suffering for the Lord. You know, I'm traveling. I'm spreading. The Apostle Paul is grieved with the sin in his life. When was the last time you started to dredge some of that up and really get honest and to bring it out into the light? So starve it. Bring it into the light. Number three, confess the lie. Confess the lie. You know what the lie hates? Truth. Lie hates truth. When you bring something that was in the dark that's in the light, it's light, it's ugly, but you can at least confess the lie. There's a, a, a passage of scripture in uh, Acts chapter 8 where people see that God is working miracles through the apostles. And these people come up to them and they say, hey, listen, can we purchase that with money? So they try to buy the gift of God with money. And the apostles say, you can't buy the gift of God with money. No, no, I'm just going to cut you a check. Like, can I get some of that? Like, how holy do I have to be? What's the dollar figure? I was at a conference once. Someone walked up and said, that's your secretary. Just write your figure on a napkin. You can't buy the gift of God with money. It doesn't work that way. There's no trade-off. There's no check you could write that will get you that. So it's important to confess it and go, Lord, maybe I'm working far too often out of my own sense of comfort. Maybe money is just dominating my worries too much. Maybe money is dominating my conversations with people I love too much. And maybe, honestly, when I think about my aspirations, the thing that I want to do, honestly, I think about money first. Here are the checks I could write. Is it possible that that's wrong? That that's a sin? Number four, intentionally choose contentment. Intentionally choose contentment. Philippians chapter 4 verse 10 says this. I gave myself whiplash in the last service trying to kind of get across here. But okay. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. It's not about the wealth. It's not about the poverty. It's about the heart. And then he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, how many of you heard the verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, and you applied that totally different, right? I, I can do all things through, like I'm going to leap across this canyon. I can do all things through him. No, that verse is in the light of being content. Lord, how do I be content in my circumstance with where you have me in my life? How do I figure this out and yet still work hard to be faithful to the next thing that's down the pike? And the answer is, you can do all things through him who gives you strength. That in him and through him, you find your fill for need and humility for abundance. He's the key. Final and last thing. Put on something better. Put on something better. Now in scripture, you'll read put on and put off. Put on and put off. Like wax on, wax off, right? It's that kind of idea. Wax on, wax off. And if you're reading the book of Colossians and you're reading the book of Ephesians, it's particularly pr prominent. Put off this list, sexual immorality, uh, gossip, falsehood, all this whole kind of list. And then he repeats that in the book of Ephesians. Put off this, and it's a little bit longer with some twists, but still it's, it's that list in there. And we tend to look at all the stuff we're not supposed to do, and we tend to forget the stuff we are supposed to put on. You clothe yourself with humility. You clothe yourself with compassion. You clothe yourself with the genuine thing. You put off the counterfeit God. You put off the lesser God of money. But don't just do that. Put on something else. One of the lies of money we said was validation. 
If you put off the validation of money in your life, I don't need money to validate who I am, what then do you put on? Well, you put on your identity in Christ. I am validated by who he says that I am. If you put off the lie of security, wealth will bring me security, what do you put on? You put on the idea that the best place I can be is to follow him even if it feels insecure. That's the best place. May maybe the most dangerous place. I'm not guaranteeing you safety. You can lose your life and follow Jesus. But you've already lost your life to follow Jesus. So it's not that I'm escaping danger, but I know the very best place for me to be, the most secure place in him, is to follow him. So you put off the lie, but make sure you put on the right part. Identify those insecurities in your life, those things that you talk about, those things that you worry about, the ways that you're trying to get attention. Look at me, I did good, Dad. L look at me, Mom. I Can I help out? Look at me, kids. See, I'm something. I'm providing. I got, I got your future. The, that is good stuff as long as it's in the right priority. And often other people will be able to tell you better than yourself because you're inside the house looking out and you need someone outside the house looking in to help you figure out how to change. Starve it. Bring it into the light. Intentionally choose contentment. I'm sorry, start with bringing it to light, confess the lie, intentionally choose contentment, and put on something better. Choose the real thing. I close with this story. Uh, great running back, Barry Sanders, uh, which I, I know I'm in the Chicago area, so hang with me, okay? <laughs> Barry Sanders, he played for the Detroit Lions. Barry Sanders was a running back. He was phenomenal. He was an incredible running back. Some of you remember seeing him run. Amen? All right, a lot of amens there, okay. When Barry Sanders was first drafted into the NFL, he was given a huge bonus check. It was a lot of money. The very first thing Barry Sanders did was to tithe off that check. Now, I, the press was confounded. They were confused. And they went to him. They said, Barry, you've just tithed off your bonus check. Like, oh my goodness, don't, aren't you worried that you're just going to inundate that organization with too much money? I mean, don't most people, what you do is you take a gift from God and then what you do is you parse it out to lots of different places because you don't want to overwhelm, Right? Well, actually, that's an offering. That's not a tithe. And Barry was like, no, this is what I'm doing. This is my commitment to the Lord. So they stop running at Barry. And you know who they go to next? They go to his pastor. Bunch of microphones in his face. Hey, pastor, what are you going to do with all the money that's coming to you from Barry Sanders? I mean, here he is. He's tithe off of his bonus check. I mean, what are you going to do now? Aren't you thrilled to have all this money? I mean, what do you think? The pastor said, oh, you want to know what I think? Yeah, what do you think? Here's what I think. Barry Sanders controls his money. His money doesn't control him. Now here's my question. Do you control your money? Or does your money control you? What do you worry about? What do you talk about? And what do you aspire to?